Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and today we have a special guest for the Grammar Girl podcast. We have Grant Faulkner, the executive director of National Novel Writing Month and the co-founder of 100 Word Story. He recently published The Art of Brevity, crafting the very short story. He's also published Fissures, a collection of 100 word stories, the short story collection, All the Comfort Sin Can Provide, uh, Nothing Short Of, Selected Tales from 100 word story, pep talks for writers, 52 insights and actions to boost your creative mojo. And he is here today to talk with us about The Art of Brevity, his newest book. Welcome, Grant. Thank you so much, Mignon. It's a treat to be here with you. Yeah, yeah. Where's my copy? I, oh, here it is. Here it is. You have the arc there. I like that. Yeah, we're both board. holding up our copies of The Art <laughs> of Brevity, uh, sort of mirror images there. How fun. Well, it's a it's a wonderful little book. I, I, not surprisingly, it's. I love that the chapters are all really short and the book is about brevity. So that's, you know, whole it, circle fullness kind of thing. Yeah, I've heard a lot of jokes about uh, going on at length about brevity, which which I can do, and I'll do here on the podcast today. But uh, yeah, I, I also joke that I think uh, the book would be better if it was about ten thousand words shorter. So there's always brevity's <laughs> brevity's always an aspiration. Put it that way. Or if you wanted to go for irony, it could be much longer. <laughs> it could be like my other joke is I want to write like a ten thousand page book on the art of brevity to truly detail <laughs> all of its nuances. Yeah. That'd be hilarious. So um, I, I solicited some questions from people Great. on social media, and I think we have a really want, good one to get us started right. from Katie Walker, who asked, what elements are essential to make a very short story? That is such a good question. And essentially, essentially I spent the whole book trying to answer that. Um, but, you know, I think one way to think about it, um, let me think if I can think through metaphors. Um like when you're writing a novel, you really have limitless land to use for your novel. You literally can write a 10,000 page novel if you really want to. You know, it's like I, I always compare a novel to a southwestern city. You know, developers in a southwestern city, they can just spread and spread and spread and the city can grow and grow and grow. There can be, you know, essentially no boundaries. But in a, in a short story, there are very tight boundaries. And so you really have to be careful with each word choice, each sentence. You have to really communicate the story, I think, through suggestions and hints and um, really kind of uh, paint your characters with very deft uh, brushstrokes. Um, so it's not like you're going to go into a whole big, long character background. And in fact, sometimes with, with flash stories, you know almost nothing about the character or it's communicated just through their dialogue and the situation, perhaps. So you rely a lot more on the reader to fill in the gaps. And I think gaps is the key word here, is that you're writing, you're not just writing with the text on the page. Like a novel is largely about the text on the page and making connections and building explanations and building this world. But with flash fiction, because it's so brief, you, you need to think about how you're building the world without the text, you know, how what you leave out um, kind of speaks through the story. And I think that's the real art in a way. Um, it's hard to explain how to do that. Um, but I try in the book. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about constraints because that part really resonated with me. I, I'm the kind of person who gets overwhelmed in the salad dressing aisle, you know, because there are just <laughs> too many choices. And to turn in anything written, I have to have a deadline. And that's a kind of constraint. Mm -hmm. Um well, and actually, let's back up just a tiny okay. bit. I feel I jumped in too fast. So can you define, actually, what do you mean by a very short story? That's and a really good question. Constraints. <laughs> yeah, that's great, because I think the definition is key. And, you know, it's traditionally defined flash fiction as stories under 1,000 words. Um, and the flash, but I think I, I think of it more through metaphors. Like, the length of the story doesn't matter so much. It's more sort of the aesthetic or the... Um, yeah, the aesthetic you're trying to tell a story with. And so that flash, uh, it was literally named, the genre was really, literally named after a flash of lightning. James Thomas and his wife uh, named it um, that way. And so it is about like a burst of illumination. That's one way to think about it. Um, it there's also microfiction, which um, the definition of that is stories under 400 words. I don't know who set these definitions. <laughs> there's no tribunal, but that's uh, kind of kind of the convention. 
But I think of like Flash, what's interesting to me is it's, it's kind of like a series of Russian nesting dolls. You know, there's the thousand word story and then there's the 400 word stories. And then I specialize or have been kind of addicted to writing hundred word stories. And I write, um, you know, manage hundred word story journal. And then it goes all the way down. Well, I mean, six word memoirs or six word stories are very popular as well. And I'm sure somebody's gone lower than that. Do you ever do the same story in all those forms? Have you ever started with a thousand and tried to narrow it down to six? That is such a good exercise. I, you know, it's, I've, I've given people the exercise to to trim it in half. You know, to write a five hundred word story and then a two hundred fifty word story and then a hundred five word story. Um, but I've, ne- yeah, I've never done all of them like that. I love that idea, though. That would be yeah. fun. Like, well, yeah. that remind what that makes me think of one thing you said in the book is that this is being taught more in schools. Um, you know, that would be a great assignment. Um, how 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 did you learn that it was being done in schools? And you know, is it being used in creative writing classes or just general English classes in general? Do you know more about how it's being used? I think all of the above. When we started Hundred Word Story, I had no idea that it would be taught in schools. Um, but we kept hearing from teachers and kept hearing from teachers who would be teaching in prisons or teaching GED classes or, or teaching immigrants. And it's a very accessible form. And that's what, I, you know, that's what I hear from teachers. And of course, it is just in terms of length. It's also like what I've heard. Um, and there is a teacher who's actually um, publishing a book with Hofton Mifflin on um, teaching 100 word stories that's coming out soon. Um, but she says that, you know, she can put like a whole story up on a projector and you can read it together in class and the teacher can uh, go over each element of the story. And, and so it's like really easier for students to kind of comprehend all the story elements with that one snapshot of a story. So I think that's one reason for its popularity. A lot of people are, are um, saying it's about the Internet. And mm-hmm. I think the internet is a factor. I mean, when I started 100 Word Story, the journal back in 2011, I felt like we were maybe late to the game back then. And I think we are one of 20 or 30 um, flash fiction sites on the internet. And, and now I think they're 200 or 300 or 2,000 or 3,000. I can't keep track. They're everywhere. And so there is like a real popularity for the forum that's emerging. And I find just anecdotally that a lot of younger people under 30 are very uh, attracted by it. Yeah. Well, you know, I loved the idea. You also called them postcard stories. Mm -hmm. And I love the idea of handwriting it on a postcard and then mailing it to someone or something like that. Absolutely. It's funny you mentioned that because I have my book launch party tonight. And one of the exercises I'm going to have uh, for attendees, I I bought all these vintage postcards and I'm going to hand them out to everybody. And, And so the postcard itself is a story prompt. And I want them to write a, a story on the back of it. And they can only use the back to tell the story. So, yeah. Nice. It's, it's, and, and so, like, with the Internet, I think these stories do fit very neatly into all the little boxes on the Internet. You know, you can publish a whole story on Facebook or Twitter. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go back for a minute to the idea of constraints and how mm-hmm. they fuel creativity. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's counterintuitive. Um, because usually we hear the word constraint and we think uh, we have negative connotations with that. And you mentioned one constraint, the deadline. And of course, mm-hmm. at NaNoWriMo, we're big believers in a goal and a deadline, that type of constraint. I think the constraint, and for me, I'll just speak through the lens of 100-word stories because it's easier for me to make that um, the point with this, is that, you know, it's... So there's nothing better about a story when it's 100 words. You know, it could be 99 words. It could be 101 words. But it's interesting to me because when I first started writing them, like my initial attempts, I could not get them down to 100 words. I'd always write like 150 words. And I sent them to, you know, kind of, kind of said, hey, I'm, I'm doing this uh, to, the, the, to the person, Paul Strom, who I first learned about 100 word stories from. And I said, hey, I wrote up a story that was 150 words, you know. And he said, no, 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 you can't stop there. You have to take it down to exactly 100 words. And he said, trust me, it will get better. Again, 100 isn't a magic number, but what happened in that was that by, by really thinking about what I, how I could pare down the story and by thinking about how I could um, let those gaps speak through the story, as I mentioned earlier, and really pay attention to each word, um, I, I did find a better story in the end. And it was because of my intensity of, um, of just paying attention to everything in the story. So, so, so the constraint kind of honed my attention uh, both 
to the world in general, because now I, I kind of look for stories in the nooks and crannies of life, as I put it. Um, so my own kind of storytelling aesthetic has changed uh, because I think a lot of the smaller stories in our lives, uh, they are they're just as significant as the bigger stories, but sometimes they don't have a place. You know, you can you can write a, a novel or a memoir with a, with a you know traditional narrative arc that's really big and kind of builds an escalation of things. But sometimes it leaves out all these like tiny moments that are very telling and very important and very dramatic. And so I think it helps me find different stories. And then I pay attention to the construction of that story in a different way. I'll offer one. Can I offer one more metaphor? Yes. <laughs> it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You know how with the Rubik's Cube, at least I still do this because I never really learned how to do it. But you you keep shuffling the colors to try to get them all to match. And so if you get all of them to match red on one side, most likely the other sides are not matched. And so when you're writing a hundred word story, it's like that. You're constantly kind of turning phrases back and forth. You know, you might add 10 words here and then pare down by seven words and then add five words and then pare down by three. You know, you're kind of constantly putting new elements in play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that metaphor. Um, my favorite metaphor in your book was that the story is like a sparkler that, you know, burns bright, but not for very long. And it, it's great that it came from the, a lightning bolt. That's cool. And I think another one you had was about, um, I believe you said an ellipsis is a metaphor, um, or at least you could use the ellipsis. So I wonder if you could talk more about that. Yeah, I think again, like ellipsis marks something that's been omitted, right? And it's a it's a, an element um, of punctuation that allows us to like visibly see something's been omitted, but that speaks to what I was talking about earlier with the gaps in the stories. Like so much about how you're constructing a story is through what's been omitted, and there's a there's a famous uh, Hemingway rule of writing where he said that to write a good short story, it's like an iceberg. An iceberg, like only ten percent of it is above the surface. And so 90% of it, the, the reader doesn't see, but the author does have a feeling for that other 90%. So it speaks through uh, what's been omitted or it speaks through the 10%. And so I think, you know, an ellipsis is a good metaphor for how to think about writing these. Um, I loved it. I, I, and I can't quote directly. I'd have to open up my book to the section on the ellipsis to get it all right. But I loved how, one, the ellipsis came from um, a printer who had been uh, publishing music. So he, he thought of it like the pause in music. And then for many, many years, the ellipsis wasn't recognized. It was a, a rogue uh, punctuation mark. And so I think that that's very interesting too, because flash fiction has its own roguelike uh, characteristics. It's kind of operated at the margins of the writing world and the mm -hmm. margins of the publishing and academic world as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, you were making me, so, uh, so many questions. So um, first, you know, you also, you're, you're very involved in NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month. You're the executive director, right? Yeah. And yeah. I'd better be involved. Uh, you better be involved, <laughs> right. And so I want to know for, first for you, which came first, NaNoWriMo or 100 Word Stories? And then what can a novel writer learn from hundred word stories like is it are they just completely different separate things or can they work together in some way that's such a good question on on a couple different levels um so i'll answer the first one um my experience with NaNoWriMo preceded hundred word story but just by a year or two i think my first NaNoWriMo was in 2008 or 2009 and i started writing hundred word stories in 2010 and then started the literary journal hundred word story in 2011 and actually, when I was talking with Chris Beatty, the founder of NaNoWriMo, um, about being on the board, because I was on the board be before I became executive director, and I told him about, you know, starting 100 Word Story, the journal, and I was kind of on the fence because I wasn't sure if I had enough time to do it. And he was the one who encouraged me to do it. So, so they really coincide in, in, in the sense of both chronology and influence in some ways. Um, and then, but, but, but it is interesting to me because I have like, you know, NaNoWriMo in, is in some ways the opposite of the right, flash fiction right. instinct, I was thinking. <laughs> you know, and, and so I always feel like somebody's going to call me out and say, you, you've betrayed the novel <laughs> by going to the short form as if there's different teams to join. <laughs> and I guess I'd say one, there aren't different teams to join. I feel like writing in different genres and different links, uh, and writing poetry, which I also espouse, you know, they all feed into each other. 
Um, and, and, and then I think what's happened with me is that the short form and writing short so much has really influenced how I think about writing a novel and my, my novel writing sensibility. And so my novel writing sensibility now is much more elliptical. Um, it is more kind of ambulatory. I do think about what I omit or leave out. And, and that's like been a crucial way for me to think about how to create suspense because suspense is created by what we leave out. You know, we're, we're dropping little hints throughout a story. And so in a novel, you're dropping a lot of hints and, and, you're, and you're escalating the action and creating more and more tension. But you're doing so on a smaller level with, with the flash fiction. And so I think it's a really good way to kind of um, you know, again, like like the teacher told me, Kim Col- Colbertson, um, you, you can see all the story elements in one snapshot. So it's a good way to learn those story elements. So mm-hmm. I think my novel writing has, and also like I, I have a chapter in the book about writing in a kind of fragmentary style. Um, I'm more, which for me is, is it, it's my form of poetry. Like I'm kind of a frustrated poet and I turn to flash fiction to, to be a poet, but through prose, not through actual poems. And I think that's made me a more kind of poetic novelist as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I made a little note to myself because in the mar- part where you talked about how you don't develop the character, you don't know a character's background in these very short stories in flash fiction, then what if there's a character in a novel who just doesn't want to know about another character's background? You know, you could use that as a way to sort of create mystery as well if someone is actively avoiding knowing about someone else. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting to think what we really know about anybody in our lives too. We have, (laughs) (laughs) you know, I mean, flash fiction kind of um, is mimetically accurate in that sense that um, you don't have to know every detail of a person's past in order to kind of experience and have pleasure or meaning, you know, Mm -hmm. with them. So same thing happens on the page. Yeah. We were talking about those little boxes online that we all write in. And I know like I have definitely noticed that the constraints of those in my, I guess you'd call it nonfiction writing, writing social media posts, that my writing does become better when I write something that's too long and then I have to edit it down to fit in that darn box, which is <laughs> frustrating, but usually it ends up better. And um, we had a question kind of about that, like from um, Rick Huerta said, does mm-hmm. your philosophy on brevity differ when writing fiction versus when writing nonfiction? You know, every kind of writing has its own aesthetic or purpose, you know, and so um, but I don't make a demarcation between fiction and nonfiction. I think, um, I mean, brevity, I, I view it all as like what I was saying earlier, you know, you learn as a writer so much from writing a poem. You can learn so much by writing a mystery. You can learn so much by writing a literary fiction novel. You can learn so much by writing flash fiction. So I think that experience of all different genres teaches you different things. And in nonfiction, there's certainly like moments for, for really brief you know, essays or, or, or articles or just pieces. I mean, as you said, you know, our, our idea of nonfiction storytelling really has changed because of social media, because we're all putting our stories into little boxes. And some people are really great at doing that, right? Like some people have mastered the form of social media. It's like a genre unto themselves. And, and part of that is their ability to, um, to uh, be brief, you know, or to tell that story in just a small space. Um, so yeah, I think, I think in some ways, you know, I'd love, I wish there was a way to do an analysis of kind of post-internet writing and and pre-internet writing to see if that kind of enforced brevity has made us better writers. I like to think that it has made us better writers. I think it's a fast, Twitter is a fascinating challenge, especially when it was 140 characters. Now we have like what, 250 characters. We can just go I hog wild. I think you just upped it to 4,000. <laughs> who knows? It changes every day. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah. but, it's a, it, but it's a wonderful exercise. And even like that constraint, we were talking about constraints earlier, but people have written novels on Twitter, you know, just through each each uh, tweet. So there's just so many. That, and that's one thing I love about flash fiction is how it opens up these other storytelling forms. You know, like I once wrote a story that was a review of Dansko Clogs on the internet. And so just in a single product review, you can have a character have a voice and reveal things about themselves and tell a story, but it's like a, technically it might be a, uh, yeah, a, re- a, a review. Product review. That's fun. Oh, how fun. Yeah. One, one other thing I really liked about the book is that you had um, exercises at the end of each chapter. They aren't like 
I don't know, there aren't tests. They're, they're just fun little exercises. Do you want to give an example of one so people can get a feel? Yeah, gosh. Um, there was the one where I, where I do have the challenge to, to write like a 500 word story and then to keep cutting it in half and kind of compare, um, compare different versions. I'm going to just open it up randomly. How about that? Sure. Um, so I'll, I'll mention this one. Um, when I was getting my uh, graduate degree in writing, my MFA, I, I took this uh, class and Bob Gluck, the professor, he challenged us to write a novel in one page. So again, this will speak to the novel writing and the flash fiction. And at the time I was like, how do you do that? And he, and he said, it's not, you're not summarizing a novel. You're not saying this happened, then that happened. You're trying to capture the essence of a novel in a single page. And so in doing that, like what I ended up doing is I was reading F. Scott Fitzgerald's notebooks, which are amazing to read. Um, and basically in his notebooks, he categorized all of his thoughts into different little buckets, you know. And I took some of the favorite phrases um, and created these two characters. And my 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 the challenge was is to give the feeling of a grand sweep of a big novel in a single page. And that is possible. You know, you can do it. And so it was a really interesting exercise in being able to um, envision a novel while enacting it very briefly. And so there's an exercise like that in the book, like write a novel in a single page. And I think it's like this search for the essence of a story that's really meaningful in writing flash fiction. I, I mentioned how the Japanese author Yasunori Kaobata, he wrote this wonderful novel, Snow Country, and he won the Nobel Prize for it. And soon, right before his death, he wrote a, he wrote a, he, he, he somehow, I don't know what he was thinking, but he, the novel wasn't right. And so he, he, he tried to capture the essence of it. And he wrote a 12 page story called the gleanings of snow country. And so it's in the gleanings in the essence, you know, where, where he found the meaning. And I think that that was so interesting. And so that's like, I, I think that, you know, you could, um, listeners, if they have like a 10 page or 20 page story, you might think about doing that. How could you make that story into one page? Or how would you write a one-page novel? I'm wondering if that's... I'm imagining it's different from what you would write to market a novel. You know, when you when you publish a novel, you have to write a marketing summary that entices mm -hmm. people to read it. And I think yeah. that would probably be different from capturing the essence of the whole thing. Or do you disagree? I think it would generally be different because I think the marketing summary is more of a, this happened than that happened. I mean, it's it's a little bit about trying to capture that mysterious essence of a novel. So there's something to it. It's not just a summary. Uh, but I do think that the initial exercise that I got was something different, you know. So my mm -hmm. kind of collage-like approach, I th at least for me, it, it fulfilled the assignment better than, than a summary. Yeah, it might be a useful exercise to get you to a good summary, but you probably wouldn't use it as the summary. Yeah, exactly. I think it, it should stand alone. It shouldn't be like a teaser for, for buying a book. Yeah. And yeah. this is just kind of a random thing that popped into my head when you mentioned earlier that you got your MFA. And I know a lot of people think about going to grad school. Like, would you do it again? Would you get an MFA again if you had <laughs> to make the choice? That is such a tough question. <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed getting my MFA. I enjoyed the classes. I enjoyed the community. Uh, I enjoyed what I learned. Um, but, you know, I went in such a different time. And it was actually really cheap then, uh, weird to say, but I went to San Francisco State and, and back then this was in the early 90s, uh, especially compared to what it costs today. I don't know what San Francisco costs, but I know just in general, um, tuition is so high. And so I, I think it's such a personal decision and so much about your finances. And I, 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 I would hesitate to advise anyone to take out a lot of loans and to, to really carry a financial burden. Um, and I think what's wonderful about today, like this was when I went got my MFA, it was pre-internet. So there actually was nano, no NaNoWriMo. There was no Grammar Girl. There were none of these wonderful free, there wasn't this infinity of YouTube videos of authors talking about their craft um, or online classes. And so there, there's so many different ways to sort of get your MFA that are unofficial. And, and I think there's so many writing communities in the world that you can join for free or for minimal cost. And so I guess I would advise people to really think about, because really what it's about in the end is learning how to be a writer, unless you really want to be a professor of creative writing, and then you should get your MFA. 
But if you just want to be a writer, um, I think you can do that without uh, paying like a huge tuition. So I just kind of advise people to, to explore other, oppor- other you know, ways to learn and be a part of yeah. a community. Yeah. yeah, thanks. That's great insight. So I have um, one final question from a listener. The, this is from Jeff Baker, and he wants to know, if you know, what is the oldest example of flash fiction that you know of? You know, I don't know the answer to that question, but well, there's Sappho who wrote, I guess, but Sappho is considered more poet, poetic, I think, um, like her fragments that she wrote. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know the whole Sappho story, but, I don't mention, <laughs> but I'm going to say, I'm going to say it's probably something to do with religion, you know, parables, I think, oh, would yeah. count, you know? Yeah, that's good. They're quite short. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we actually come from, uh, like flash fiction isn't new. Uh, I have a quote from Rebecca Mackay, a contemporary author, but she has she puts forward the theory that that in our daily lives, like if you're if you're at a dinner party, it's very rare for somebody to tell a story that's longer than 500 words. You know that we actually speak in these kind of like very very short stories, and I think that that's true. So um, yeah, so I think I think oral storytelling is generally pretty short. Yeah. So we had the epic poetry, but most people thousands of years ago were probably just sitting around the campfire telling. Hundred words, Little stories. Hundred word stories. Yeah, maybe be like I saw this bear. <laughs> I ran, <laughs> I ran. I ran home. It chased me. You know? <laughs> I fell Wonder. in love along the way. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's the conflict, the the romance. Yeah, it's exactly. got everything. <laughs> it's got the high stakes. Yeah, if you tell it right, if you tell that bear story right, it can be a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, again, the book is the art of brevity. Crafting the Very Short Story by Grant Faulkner, who is with us today. Grant, where where can people find you? Where's the best place to catch up with you online? And You know, I am Grant Faulkner basically everywhere where I am online. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, my website, it's all Grant Faulkner, uh, one word. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to just say one, one thing I thought of before this interview, Mignon, is I sure. could have t- titled this book, The Grammar of, of Brevity. So. Yeah, you could have. Yes, because grammar is sort of a metaphor for all those things, too. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I just highly recommend your book. Again, The Art of Brevity. Um, you can get it where all fine books are sold. And um, yeah, the, and, and, and also, um, also, you know, I have to give a little plug for NaNoWriMo, too, because I love NaNoWriMo as well. And so... Uh, if you're interested in writing a novel instead of a hundred word story, also check out nanorimo.org, correct? Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mignon. Um, we are lovers of Grammar Girl. And in fact, I want everybody to know that you're on our writer's board. So we appreciate your support. In I am. Place. I should have disclosed that at the beginning, actually. Disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. But it's not a paid <laughs> position. So I'm I'm fine. No conflicts of interest. <laughs> That's right. We're fellow supporters. Because I love the organization. Yeah. Well, great. Well, thank you so thanks much. so much.